Praise the Lord. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study today in Jesus' name. If you've been coming before, you know that we are in Revelation. And we just finished Revelation chapter 4 last week. Please open your Bible to Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are, and were created. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, as all things created, thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. Thou art worthy, O Lord, stand up and sing. In that verse, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor. And power. For thou hast created, as all things created, thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. Thou at worthy, O Lord, sing it, let me hear you. Glory and honor, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, as all things created, Thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Amen. Close eyes. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you very much for the Bible study we have tonight. We bless your name because you have made us to know that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is worthy. Worthy to receive praise, glory, honor, and power. We are praying, O oh Lord, that our lives will be a continual, uninterrupted flow of praise unto the Lord in Jesus' name. As we come to study your word tonight, we are praying that you grant us understanding in your word in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you grant us the key of understanding so that our understanding will be enlightened in Jesus' name. Be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you. God bless you. You can be seated. As I said, we've done, we've already studied Revelation chapter 4. And you'll see that in Revelation chapter 4, there's one word that comes over and over and over again. And it is the throne. That is the throne of God on which the Almighty God himself sits. As you come to chapter 5, there is another centrality you find in chapter 5. Open your Bible, let me read it with you. Revelation chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat 
on the throne, a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open or to read and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders to the lamb, a seed had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb. Having every one of them had and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And he sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hast made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand and ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, What is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing? And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and and power be unto him that seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. If you have followed through on what we have read just now, you'll find that there is a word that comes up over and over and over again. It's the word, the book. You look at verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, a book written within and on the back side. That book sealed or seven seals. You go to verse 2, you find the book again. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seals thereof. Go to verse 3, you are going to find that book again. And no man in heaven, nor in, uh, in the earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book neither to look thereon the book appears in verse 4 and i went much because no man was found worthy to open or to read the book neither to look thereon even as you go to the next verse you're going to find the book is still there and one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. You are going to find then that is the book that you have mentioned over and over and over again in verse 7. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne in verse 8. And when he had taken the book, it's the book. That is the centrality of everything here in verse 9 you have. And the song, a new song, saying that worthy to take the book and to lose the seals thereof. You find then as you come to chapter 5, there is something that is very central. And it is the book. And the next individual, the next personality that is central is the Lamb of God himself. That's why the title of the message today is the Lamb's worthiness to open the sealed book the sealed book actually is a scroll and it's like when you have a long sheet of paper you roll it up and that roll that scroll was sealed seven times and then they wanted someone in heaven on earth 
anywhere in the whole universe to come and open the seals, break the seals, and unravel and reveal and read what is therein. And because of the centrality, because of the importance of that book, that's why John wept when there was nobody to open that book. I need to remind you, John is still in heaven now, in the revelation, in what we're studying. Because at the beginning of chapter 4, it said he was in the spirit. He had a voice that said, come up hither. And then he found himself in heaven. When he got to heaven, he began to see the glory and the splendor and the power and the majesty of the almighty God sitting upon the throne. And then he found the redeemed of the Lord in heaven and all the angelic hosts in heaven worshiping the Lord. And the worship of those angels and the worship of the redeemed is what comes to the climax at the end of chapter 4. Now he comes to chapter 5 and he comes to another scene which is very crucial to the uh, understanding of the series of events that will begin now to take place as we go on to chapter 6. This is an important vision indeed. The revelation of great mysteries of things that will still happen. I need to remind you that right now, that he is in the place where we are studying. The church age at close. Chapters 2 and 3, you have the church there. At the end of chapter 3, the church is in heaven. And then there is preparation taking place that there will be a delude, the wrath of God, falling upon this world in what is called the Great Tribulation. As a preparation of that, you have the scene or the scenery in heaven. And as you see that in heaven, you'll see the glory, the wonder, the thunderings, and the lightnings, and the majesty, and the mercy of God, and the rainbow around the throne of God. Not only that you have that majestic sight around the throne of God, you have the angels of God, you have the elders representing the redeemed, raptured saints of God, all around the throne. And then you have the almighty God himself, the great I am that I am, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one that was and is and will yet be the Alpha and the Omega, sitting upon that throne. And then eventually you find the Lamb. And then you find all those who are in heaven giving glory to the one sitting on the, la on, on the throne and also giving glory unto the Lord, the God of heaven. And uh, would you see that in chapter 5, when chapter 5 begins, it says, and... That's the beginning of chapter 5, which means there's a connection between chapter 5 and chapter 4. This chapter then, in this chapter 5, begins with the Almighty God, the creator of the heavens and they are sitting upon the throne with a book, a scroll, sealed with seven seals in his hand. The content of the book, very important for the world, for the redemption of the world, for taking the world back out of the hand of the usurper. It's been sealed seven times, written within and on the back side. But the contents John did not know. And no angel knew. And no man knew. Nobody in the whole universe knew the content of this seven sealed scroll or book. Because it wasn't known to John. It wasn't known to any other man. It wasn't known to an angel. That's why an announcement was made in heaven. Who is worthy to take the book? Who is worthy to lose or to break the seals thereof? Because to know the content of the mysteries written within that sealed scroll, it must be unsealed, it must be unrolled, it must be revealed and read. When a scroll was written, a part was written, then it was rolled up and sealed. Another part was written, it was rolled up and sealed. Another part written, rolled up and sealed. If you look up at me here, what it mean, means is, if this is the old scroll that was stretched out, you write a little part here, you roll it up, you seal it at this edge here. You write a little part more, you roll it up, and you seal it here. You, you write more, you seal it here. You write more, you seal it here. Until you seal it seven times. And if anybody is going to roll it, is going to lose it, is going to open it up, he has to break the seals. And those seals were generally made in those days of wax. And then there will be the signature, the stamp, of the one that is writing and concealing, hiding the document or the content of the, of the roll. Uh, he will put a stamp there. If you broke that seal, you will not be able to repair it perfectly again. That's why you will wait until the authorized person, until the one that has the authority and the power and uh, the, the approval of the one that wrote it, he will come and then he'll break the seals. 
He will open it. Then he will read it out. So these seven seal scroll that we are reading about here had never been opened. Its opening is very important in the revelation of future events. How important then is the scroll? You know how important it is because when there was nobody to come and open the book, open the scroll, John wept in heaven because nobody was found to roll it, to reveal the content. Then the angel, the angels when that when eventually the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and the root of David, when he eventually came up and he took the book from the right hand of him that sits upon the throne, all the creatures, all the redeemed of the Lord, all the angels of God, in their myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands, the whole universe, they burst into a shout and song of praise and worship because the worthy one, Jesus Christ, has been found is ready now to take that book, open the seal, and reveal the contents thereof. That's how important the book is. And wonderful you are here tonight. So that we'll see the beginning of this together. You will not finish the whole of chapter 5 today. We'll, we'll get to verse 7. And then in the next study we're going to have in Revelation, we'll continue and conclude the teaching in the whole of chapter 5. This is just marvelous and it's what the whole universe the redeemed of the lord what they have been waiting for for ages you need to understand now as we look at this study we're going to break into three parts number one the significance of the seven sealed book significant book important book essential book the significance of the seven sealed book number two the search for the worthy one who is worthy to take the book and to break the seal, and to open the book, and to read the contents thereof. The search for the worthy one. Number three, the selection of the worthy one. After the search had been made, eventually, the only one worthy to take the book, and to open it, and to break the seals, he came up, and he was selected. The selection of the worthy one. Come back to, chapter, uh, to the first point. The first point, the significance of the seven sealed book. Revelation chapter 5, reading from verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on a throne, a book written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. He said, I saw. As you look at John, and you see what John is writing down. You will discover that John, in this chapter, he said, I saw, I saw, I beheld, I beheld. Because it was being revealed to him. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw. And then in verse 2, and I saw. As we jump down to verse 6, and I beheld. You go to verse 11, and I beheld. He was seeing it. It was like the events. In fact, that's what you'll find as you go through the book of Revelation. When you come to chapter 6, all as the seals have been broken, and then the roll is being unrolled. Instead of reading it to John, all that happened is that when the first seal is broken, then it's dramatized. And then he saw it, he beheld it. And then when that passed, and the second seal is broken, instead of reading it to him and telling him, this is the content of the book. And this is what you'll find if you are able to read the scroll. It's dramatized. And then you will say, I saw it again. And so as he began to tell us, I saw and I beheld, I saw and I beheld, he continues like that, seeing and beholding, and seeing and beholding. You come to that, verse 1. He said, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Who is this one sitting upon the throne? Let the scriptures answer for you. In Revelation chapter 19, I want to look at the one that is sitting upon the throne. Who is he? I'm sure you know him already, but let's see what the scripture is saying as to the identity and the personality and the supremacy and the power and the might of that one sitting upon the throne. In Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 4. And the four and twenty elders and the four bees fell down 
and he worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. So you'll find then, this verse 4, chapter 19 tells us who is the one that is sitting upon the throne. It's God Almighty himself, God that sat on the throne. If you go to chapter 21, verses 5 and 6, the identity, the majesty, the greatness, the glory, the splendor of the one that sits upon the throne. 21, verse 5 and verse 6, and he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Is the creator, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And the one that creates all things and recreates all things, the one that makes all things new, is the one that sat upon the throne. And he said unto me, Right, for these, are, these words are true and faithful. And he said, Who is the one saying here that's the one sitting upon the throne? And he said, It is none. I am Alpha and Omega. Who is the one sitting on the throne? The Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. I will give unto him that's the first the, of the fountain of the water of life freely. As you go to other parts of the Bible, you are going to find the same thing. That the identity of the one sitting on the throne had been revealed a long time before this time. That's why John did not have to explain. And John did not have to label or identify or give you the name of the one sitting upon the throne when it comes to chapter 5 of Revelation. Put on your Bible to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, reading from verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And you will see what Isaiah saw. He said, yes, there was a throne. And there was someone sitting upon that throne. Who is that one? It's the Lord himself. It's the one that all heaven is worshipping. Look at verse 2. Above his two, the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face. And with twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Who is the one sitting on the throne? The glorious one. The one that his glory is filling the whole earth. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the whole house was filled with smoke. Turn your Bible to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, looking at the identity of the one that sits upon the throne. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ancient of days did sit. Did you see then what John is saying when he said, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, not one that sat on the throne, that's the ancient of days, whose garment was white as white as snow. And, his, and the air of his head like white, like pure wool. His throne was like fairy flame. And his wheels as burning fire. And in verse 13, as well as verse 14. 13 and 14. That same Daniel chapter 7. I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. And came to the ancient of days, and they brought him, the son of man, near before him, before the ancient of days. And there was given him dominion and glory, and a kingdom, that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His kingdom is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. It's very clear to you as we compare scripture with scripture then. That the one that sits upon the throne, the throne of glory, the throne of supremacy, the, the throne of the whole universe, is this one, the ancient of days, is the Lord himself, is the God of heaven. As I saw him that way, John saw him that way, and Daniel saw him that way, and all the other prophets of God who have ever seen the picture, the glory of heaven, and the one sitting on the throne, they've also seen the glory, the majesty, the splendor of the one of God, the God of heaven, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, seated upon the throne. Come back to Revelation chapter 5, and then it says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, 
a book written and on the within and on the back side sealed with seven seals a book a sealed book a closed book a book that cannot be read until it is open until the seals are broken unrolled revealed and read a seven sealed book in the hand of god almighty who is seated on the throne of the universe of the of the of universal sovereignty the scroll was sealed seven times that means it was completely and perfectly sealed so that no one except someone worthy and qualified will be able to open it many things in the book of revelation you know are symbolic what then is the symbolic meaning of this seven sealed book or scroll you need to understand this when you are studying the book of revelation and you go back to the book of daniel and other books that are prophetic like that you need to have some understanding of ancient history in ancient history in ancient times a roman wheel would be sealed seven times so that no one would be able to look into it without being authorized. A wheel is something that somebody writes. It says, I want to disrupt my property. All this, they belong to me. It's my inheritance. It's my heritage. And this is the way I want to dispense of my property. And he writes it down. He writes in a wheel. But it's for an appointed time. Therefore, it's not published in the newspapers, it's not put on the table, it's not put there for everybody to read. Therefore, it rolls it up. And the way it rolls it up, it doesn't seal its seven seals straight line on the edge. What it does is, because if it seals it just seven times on the edge, that's very easy to open. It rolls it a little and seals it. It rolls it a little more and seals it. It rolls it a little more, it puts a, a seal. He rolls it a little bit more and he puts his seal until he seals everything seven times all over. Even if you open the outer seal, you still will not be able to read everything. And the same thing with the contracts that are made in those days. And the title deeds of land or the inheritance. All that thing will be written, rolled up and sealed in the same way. The content of the contract, or the content of that will, or the content of the title deed will be written inside, in details, every detail, as to the owner, the possessor. Everything will be written. And then, the one that is authorized to come and open it, everything is written inside. Then, on the outside of it, there will be the summary of what you have inside. That's what you have written inside, and then on the outside. To reclaim the inheritance, the qualified person who was to redeem that uh, property, he will then come in the presence of witnesses and he will open the book. Have you seen here? You have a throne. You have the Almighty God. And you have the creator of the heavens and the earth, the possessor of the heavens and the earth. He holds onto that book because it will not be given to the hand of any other one except the qualified one. Do you see all the witnesses there? Do you see the angels of God around the throne? And the redeemed of the Lord around the throne? Do you hear the announcement? Who is worthy to open the book and to read the contents of the book? And then the worthy one eventually came. And until the worthy one came, that book was not re released unto anyone. And then it was given to him. And then was their shout, praise, worship adoration in heaven because the worthy one has appeared to open that book let me show you an example in the old testament you find in jeremiah chapter 32 jeremiah chapter 32 reading from verse 6 as we're talking about the inheritance we're talking about a piece of land we're talking about a heritage we're talking about a will and then the worthy one is come so that He'll be able to now take it in the presence of other witnesses. In Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 6. And Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Behold, Anamel, the son of Shalom, thine uncle, shall come unto thee, saying, By thee my field that is in Anathoth, for the right of redemption is thine to buy it 
I want you to notice every word. The right of redemption. The only one that has the right. is It wasn't everybody that had the right of redemption. But this man, Anamiel, he came to Jeremiah. He says, you're my uncle. And he says, we're related. And this parcel of land, you can buy it of me. You can purchase it for me. You can redeem it for me because you have the right of redemption. What has Jesus Christ done? Has he not purchased? Has he not redeemed? Has he not bought us over? Oh, the love that sought me. Oh, the grace that brought me to the fold. And the blood that bought me. Wondrous grace that brought me into the fold. The buying, the purchasing, and the redeeming is by the, is by the Redeemer, the Lord himself. He says the right of redemption is thine to buy it. And in verse 8, so, and Amiel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the prison according to the word of the Lord. And he said unto me, buy my field, I pray thee, I'm pleading with you, that is in Anatoth. Then he said, which is in the country of Benjamin. For the right of inheritance is thine. Do you hear that? The right of inheritance is thine. Who is the one that is to inherit all things? Is it not Jesus Christ? That all things have been put into his hand. That's what we are talking about. That this book you are reading about, in the book of Revelation, it contains the content of how he is to recover I is to get back. I is to buy back. I is to restore back unto himself the inheritance that actually belongs to him. And then he said, the redemption is thine. Buy it for thyself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field of Anamiel, my uncle's son, that was in Anatol, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver, and I subscribed the evidence. Listen to this. I subscribed the evidence of the purchase and sealed it and took witnesses and weighed him the money. I paid the price in the balances. Isn't that what Jesus Christ has done? That is greater than what we're reading. In the case of what we're reading, it was just a parcel of land. In the case of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the whole earth. And we have the evidence. And everybody can testify that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. The evidence is there. And he has purchased us. He has redeemed the whole world. And any, anybody can, that will believe now, that redemption will become his. But he has not only redeemed we human beings, he has redeemed the whole earth. That's why he has a right to take that book. And then it says, so I took the evidence of the purchase in verse 11. Both that which was sealed according to the law and the custom, and that was that which was opened. And I gave the evidence of the purchase unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, the son of Messiah, in the sight of Anamiel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase, the book of the purchase that was sealed. And then it says, before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. And I chat Baruch before them, saying, Thus says the Lord, of course, the God of Israel. Take these evidences, this evidence of the purchase, both that which is sealed and this evidence which is open, and put them in an earthen vessel that they may continue many days. That is, keep that seal book, so that when the time comes, for me to recover my property that I have bought, will bring the sealed book out, will open it, will read it out, and they will know that the right of purchase and the right of inheritance is mine. Come back to Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw in the hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. As you think about this, you are thinking about the whole earth. Because the Bible says in Psalm 24, verse 1, it says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Uh, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Do you remember what Satan said in Luke chapter 4, 
verse 5, verse 6, and verse 7. Open your Bible in Luke chapter 4. See what Satan said concerning the kingdoms of the earth. Be because we we'll read the Bible, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But look at what they said the devil is saying. In Luke chapter 4, verse 5, and the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. That is delivered unto me. Ah, that's why the Bible says is the God of this world. That's why the Bible says is the prince of this world. That's why the Bible says that is the one that controls this earth at this present time. Because it's been delivered unto him from the time of the fall of Adam. But it will not remain forever with the devil. That's why you find in this chapter 5 of Revelation that that book that contains the evidence that the inheritance belongs to the Lord. He has bought it. He has purchased it. He has redeemed it. But it's not in his hand at present. The devil is claiming that it's in his own hand. And that it's only Jesus Christ will bow down and worship him. He'll give it back to him. But now the time has come that God Almighty will take it out of the hand of the thief. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come, that they might have life, that they may have it more abundantly. And Christ now has come, and the inheritance that belongs to him, that have been written in that seven sealed scroll, is to buy it back. Look at what the devil said. He said, to whomsoever I will, I give it. If that therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. But I want you to understand that eventually everything will come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. I said it will come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible says, look at that revelation again, chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 11. That worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. Satan did not create anything. But God has created all things. And for thy pleasure they were, they are. And were created is for thy pleasure, but now it's in the hand of a usurper, in the hand of a thief, in the hand of an intruder. That's why the Lord is going to come and is going to receive everything back. Have you seen that that book is a sealed book? And look at Ezekiel chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2, reading from verse 9 and verse 10. Ezekiel 2, verses 9 and 10. And when I looked, and behold, behold, and hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book that was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, that's on the back side, and there was written therein lamentation and mourning and woe, lamentation and mourning and woe. You understand what that is saying? It's saying that when Jesus Christ eventually takes that book back, there's going to be lamentation in the world because the devil will not just surrender that book just like that. As you go on in the book of Revelation, you are going to see that those seven seals, as they are opened one by one, one by one, one by one, you'll see the calamities that will come upon the world. How is that? You cannot get uh, something, your property, from the hand of a thief just like that easily. You have to judge him. You have to pour some wrath on him. And you have to put some indignation on him. And when it becomes so tense for him and so terrible for him, then he'll be able to surrender everything. And look at it in Revelation chapter 6. I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder. And one of the four beasts said, saying, Come and see. That is, when Jesus Christ took that book, he began to open it. When he, took, when he took it and opened the first seal, there was thunder. And that's to strike fear in the, hand, in the heart of the usurper in verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. That was, a da that was danger. And it was death that was going to follow because there was going to be war. And that's when the great tribulation will actually be poured upon the earth. That the series of events, the series of calamities that will be taking place at the time of the Great Tribulation will be taking place as a result of opening the seals of the book. Understand, because the devil is holding tight to the earth. 
and it's a sip, it's a usurper, it's an intruder. And Christ wants to take his possession back. And you have to take the rod of judgment, knock it on the hand of that devil. And when it pains him so much, and you knock it at the Antichrist, and you knock it at the false prophets, and you knock it at all the people that are supporting the devil, eventually they will release everything. And when the seventh seal is open, then you have the trumpet judgments coming upon the world. And when the seventh trumpet is blown, you have all the seven vials coming, pouring judgment on the earth. And when everything, when the seventh is eventually effected, you will find the announcement that now everything is done. Look at Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. Revelation 11 verse 15. And when the seventh angel sounded... And there, there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. It's not until all the seals are broken and the judgments come upon the devil and the antichrist and the false prophet and the beast and all, and all the people in the time of the great tribulation. It's not until the climax, the seventh trumpet is blown that eventually that the whole earth will then become that of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we were reading here that the ownership of the world belongs actually to God by creation, to Christ by redemption. The unrolling of the scroll reveals how Christ, the worthy one, will take back what rightfully belongs to him. During the great tribulation, the seals of the scroll will be broken and the contents will be revealed as God pours out his fury and his wrath upon the world, upon the Antichrist, upon Satan. And when the seventh angel sounds, his trumpet which is the last event contained in the breaking of the seventh seal. Then great voices in heaven will proclaim that the kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and shall reign forever and ever. We now go to point number two, the search for the worthy one. The search for the worthy one. I come to Revelation chapter 5 and we're looking at verses 2, 3, and 4. Revelation chapter 5. Verses 2, 3, and 4. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. You see, the, you see the story here. You see what is taking place here. It is taking place in heaven. And John was looking at everything. And all eyes are on that book. Because it is, that is the title deed of the inheritance of the whole world. And we know who it belongs to. But now, the usurper is still sitting on it and holding on to it. And therefore the strong angel announced in heaven, a mighty angel proclaiming in heaven with a loud voice. It was a loud voice. See, see what it's saying. Number one, it was a strong angel. It was a mighty angel. And even if he did not raise his voice, being a strong angel, everybody should hear. But now even the strong angel, he raised his voice and it was a loud voice. And it, there came a question, who is worthy to open the book and to open the seals thereof? That one, that one of the highest angels should make such a proclamation shows the importance of the inquiry of that question. This proclamation was to be made in all of heaven and all the earth, in all the whole universe. The voice of that strong angel was to be heard in all those distant places in search of someone worthy to open the book. And a question went forth and everybody could hear, who is worthy? To open the book. And nobody came out. Not an angel. Not any man. Not a great man. Not a rich man. Not a man that lived generations before. Not even holy men like Enoch, like Moses. Like David, like Samuel. Like all the people that lived prophets of old in the old generation. Like Asa, like Jeremiah. No one was able to come. At this time, even, even Peter and the rest of the apostles were there, and none of them was worthy. And John looked around. 
Does that mean that nobody will be able to come out and take this book? Does that mean that the inheritance will always be in the hand of the devil? Does that mean that the possessor, the redeemer, is not available to be able to redeem the whole creation? And when he saw the consequence, if nobody will be able to come, then he wept. They were asking that question in heaven, who is so exalted in rank, exalted in office, exalted in power, who is so comprehensive in attributes as to be authorized and worthy and qualified to open the book and to, open, and to lose the seals thereof? Who is the worthy one who is able to redeem the earth, to take the inheritance back from the usurper and to overthrow the intruder who has authority and ability to open the book? That's the question that went forth. Do you understand? You would weep if there was no one that will redeem you, if there was no one that will open the gate of heaven for you, if there was no one that could deliver you out of the hands and the cage and the captivity of the devil, you too you will cry. If the question comes out, even if it were not the whole earth and the whole universe, if it were just you as an individual, and there you are in a cage, and you belong to the Lord, and he has redeemed you, and he died on the cross for you. And you want to come out of the cage to believe on the Lord so that he can hold you in his arms and get to the gate of heaven and open the gate of heaven and you will go to heaven. Because if you don't come out of that cage, then you will belong, you will be in the captivity of the devil. If you die in that condition, you will go to hell. If the announcement was made in heaven, look at this man in the cage and look at this woman in the cage who is able who is worthy to come and open the cage and release him and reconcile him with God and forgive all his sins and then write his name in the book of life and seal him for heaven forever and ever. You'll be eager. You'll be watching whether somebody will come and appear and open your cage and then get you out of captivity, get you to the gate of heaven and present you to the almighty God and say, I've redeemed him, I've saved him, he's in heaven forever. What if nobody showed up? What if you saw the devil smiling and laughing, saying, you are mine, you are mine forever. We're going to go to hell forever. Together, you will cry to you. That's why John cried. That's why he wept. When there was no one that will come, that will be able to open the seal thereof. No one was found worthy, not an angel, not a man. No one was found worthy to examine and to execute the contents of the seven seal scroll. John wept. It was because if no one was found, the earth would continue to be in the hands of the usurper. And the curse will never be reversed if nobody came to open that book and to get the inheritance back from the hand of the devil. Satan would have everlasting dominion and victory. Why it not for Christ, the worthy one? It's not only John that will weep. Why it not for Jesus Christ that came and he took that book and he opened the seals thereof and released the inheritance so that you'll come back to, to the Lord. Why it not for that? The whole world, the whole human race will be weeping in despair forever and ever. Now, and that's the reason why he waved. I want you to see as we analyze all those verses in John in Revelation chapter 5, reading from verse 2, and I saw a strong angel. Those angels are strong and mighty. All the angels of God are strong and mighty. In Psalm 103, Psalm 103, looking at verse 20, Bless the Lord, ye is angels that exert in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. And says, it's one of those strong mighty angels that came and made the announcement to his worthy to open that book. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 21, looking at the might of the angels and the strength of the angels and the ability of the angels. In Revelation chapter 18, verse 21. Revelation 18, verse 21. And a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down, and shall be found no more, at all, only a mighty strong angel can announce that. And then it says, uh, look at uh, that uh, chapter 5 in verse 2. The, the question that is asked, and what the question is all about, I saw that uh, strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. 
uh, the implication that is sealed means that it's closed, that nobody can read it because it's closed in Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29, verses 11 and 12. The implication of the book being sealed, the scroll being sealed. And the vision of all is become unto you as the works of a book that is sealed which men deliver unto one that is learned saying read this i pray thee and it says i cannot because it is sealed they, that is when it is sealed it can spread no matter how learned you are no matter how intelligent you are how knowledgeable you are you cannot read it because it is sealed and then in verse 12 it says and the book is delivered to him that is not learned saying read this i pray thee and he says i'm not learned if i'm not learned even if you open it i cannot read it if the inspiration of the spirit of god is not there if the authority of the almighty god is not placed upon you even if somebody opens it you'll not be able to execute what is written inside that book you you find what it says there's no man no man no man was found no not in heaven not anywhere to be able to open the seals thereof in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 28. Isaiah 41, verse 28. For I beheld, and there was no man. I beheld, and there was no man. Uh, have you ever been in your life? And, and in that need, you are looking for someone to come and help you. So you feel that you are at, you are at your wit's end. And, now, and that if somebody doesn't come urgently to answer this question, to solve this riddle, or to solve this problem, you are gone. You are lost. And then there is no man. What perplexity that will bring. For I beheld, and there was no man, even among them. And there was no counselor that, when I asked of them, could answer a word. That's the situation that John the Beloved found when he, when he was seeing that vision, that revelation in heaven. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah 59, verse 16. In chapter 59, verse 16, it says, and he saw that there was no man, and he wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. Eventually, he had to do it himself because there was no other person to do it. In Isaiah chapter 63, verses 5 and 6, Isaiah 63, 5 and 6, Luke, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to oppose. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me. And my fury, it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger. And will make them drunk in my fury. I will bring down, I will bring down their strength to the earth. That's what will happen during the great tribulation. When Jesus Christ takes that book. And he begins to open the seals thereof. That's exactly what will happen. Now, uh, as you see in that Revelation chapter 5, when there was nobody that will be able to open the book or to look thereon, you look at chapter 5 verse 4, and I wept. Not only just that I wept, I wept much. Remember that it wasn't on earth, it was in heaven. How could John weep in heaven? Because of the revelation he saw. And he told you the reason why he wept. He said, I wept because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Uh, can I just enlighten you on that weeping that John had to do in heaven? If you turn your Bible back to the Psalms, in Psalm 137, Psalm 137, I'm reading to you from verse 1. Psalm 137, verse 1, By the rivers of Babylon, there were sat down, yea, were wept, when we remembered Zion. Here the children of Israel, they said, we are taken captive in our captivity. When we didn't see any hope of deliverance, it's like, are we going to die in captivity? And we remembered Zion. We remember the promises of God. We remember the glory of God in Zion. Shall we ever see Zion? Shall we ever see the beauty and the splendor and the glory and the majesty of the Almighty God that reigns in Zion? Is our sin that brought us into this, into this captivity in Babylon. We sat down there, we wept. You can think about John now in heaven. And when the redemption of the earth is read about heaven, he has heard about heaven. And Jesus Christ has spoken about the glory of heaven. In my father's house, I mean in mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
And the only way that we'll be able to have that, and then as we read in Second Peter, because Peter was a companion, a companion apostle of John, he talked about the new heavens and the new earth, where dwelleth righteousness. But the present earth, there is no righteousness dwelling in the present earth. If righteousness is going to dwell all over the earth, and Christ is going to set up his millennial reign and possess everything again, this book, as to be taken by Christ. And when there was nobody to take that book, he said, ah, this is like Israel in Babylon. Are we ever going to come out of this captivity? They wept at that time. That's why he was weeping over there when he saw what was happening in Ezra chapter 3. Ezra chapter 3. I'm reading there from verse 12. You will understand uh, why John wept. Because all the people, the saints of God, the prophets of God, have wept before him too in similar situations. It says in Ezra chapter 3 verse 12, But many of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers, who were ancient men, ancient men, old men, they had seen the glory of the former tabernacle. They had seen the glory of the former age. Now, when he saw this new tabernacle, it had no beauty, it had no glory, that had seen the first house. When the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, they wept with a loud voice. They wept with a loud voice. The reason is because the glory of what they saw now will not match the glory they had seen before. And so as John was in heaven, and he was thinking of the redeemed of the Lord, I was thinking of the earth, the earth below here, the pollution, the crime, the evil, and all that satanic, demonic things that were taking place. And I was imagining if Christ will come back and he will possess this earth again. Before he can possess it, he has to own the title deed. Because that's the document of the land. That's the document of the inheritance. And it's in the hand of the Almighty. And then the, the cry is made, the announcement is made. Who is able to take this book? containing the inheritance and the title deed of the earth. And when nobody was found, it means glory is gone. And glory will never come. That's why he wept. I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. In Jeremiah chapter 31, we're looking at verse 16 and verse 17. Jeremiah 31 verse 16. Thus says the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping, and thine eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. Why will they be weeping? Because they're in the land of the enemy. And there's no, there's no redemption, there's no deliverance inside. And so, then God said, don't weep anymore now. The victory is won, the devil is conquered, the enemy is brought down. And the people will come from the far land and they will inherit their inheritance. And there in verse, in verse 17, there is hope. It was because John thought it was hopeless and that book will never be will never be redeemed and the title deed will never be opened and inheritance will never become ours, will never belong to the Lord. It was a hopeless case. That's why he waved. And then he said, and there is hope. In thine end, says the Lord, that thy children shall come again to thy border. You'll possess it again in Lamentation chapter 1. Lamentation chapter 1. Verse 15 and verse, verse 15 through to verse 17. It says, The Lord has trodden under all my, all my mighty men in the midst of me. It says, He has called an assembly against me to crush my young men. And the Lord has trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, in, the, in a wine press. For these things I weep. Captivity, suffering, oppression. As if there will be no deliverance anymore. That's why John wept. And mine eye, mine eye runneth now with water. Because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. That's why John wept. The comforter. The one that will comfort us and redeem the whole earth. When it was nowhere to be found. And nobody was able to open that book. And to take that book. And to reveal what is inside. And to take back the possession of the earth. That's why he cried. My children are desolate. Because the enemy has prevailed. Zion spreadeth forth her hands. And there is none to comfort her. The Lord has commanded concerning Jacob. And that his adversaries shall be round about him. Jerusalem is a, a menstruous woman among them. Rejected, dejected. And not shall be restored again. That's why John waved. 
I'm asking, is it only John that is weeping? It's not the whole creation crying. If there will not be a redeemer, look at Revelation, uh, Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, looking at it from verse 20. Romans chapter 8, verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him that has subjected the same in hope, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Not only they, but ourselves also, which are the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves, we groan, we mourn, and we weep, and we are dejected within ourselves, waiting for the adoption that is the redemption of our body. That is, as the people of God themselves are even waiting for the redemption, for the adoption, and for the recreation, the resurrection of the body. And they are waiting in hope. And then when it appears, it's not forthcoming. There's groaning. There is mourning. There is weeping. That's the reason John was weeping. Look at Revelation now, chapter 5. We come to point number 3. Point number 3. The selection of the worthy one. The selection of the worthy one. Wonderful verse. Hey, look at verse 5, chapter 5, verse 5. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the, the seven seals thereof. Not one single seal will remain unloosed. John, don't cry anymore. Because the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has prevailed, he has overcome, and he's able, he's worthy, he's qualified to open that book. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, and sent forth into all the earth. And he came, and he took the book, out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. It was the appearance of Jesus Christ that changed everything, that turned everything around, that dried up the tears in the eyes of John, in the face of John. Can I tell you the same thing in your own life? It's when Jesus appears, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole earth. It's when he appears in your life. All your sorrow, all your tears, and all the, all the things that make you to mourn and to groan. Everything will be wiped away until Christ comes, until the Lamb of God comes, and he takes over the writing of the book in your own life. What is written for your possession, and he wants to effect it. There will be no cause for joy. There will be no cause for happiness. But if the Lamb has come. And it comes to open that book. Then you can dry all your tears. It says, weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Now the people of Israel and the Jewish people, they knew that was a title of the Messiah. If you look back into the prophecy of Jacob concerning his sons, you'll find in Genesis chapter 49, when he spoke about Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion in the tribe of Judah. In Genesis chapter 49, verse 9 and verse 10, Judah is a lion's web. That's a tribe there. Judah is a lion's web. From the prey, my son, thou art come up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver before from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall all the gathering, shall the gathering of all the people be. That's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 9, he talks about Judah as a lion, old lion, strong lion, mighty lion. And then he tells us that actually the ultimate fulfillment of what he's saying will be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. The lion of the tribe of Judah, unto him shall all the people come. Do you remember when Balaam was offering or declaring his prophecy? And he spoke about Judah, and he spoke about Lion, about the people of God, in Numbers chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24, reading there in verse 9. 24 verse 9 of Numbers. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion. Who shall stir him up? 
blessed is he that blesses thee and cursed is he that curses thee. Again, it's still the Messianic prophecy and Messianic line. And it's talking about the very fact that is the lion of the tribe of Judah. In Hebrews chapter 7 verse 14, telling us about Jesus Christ who came. And he came through the tribe of Judah. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. It is evident that our Lord came out, sprang out of Judah. Judah. Now, Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, talking about Jesus Christ, his identity, and his title. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, and I, I Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. The second title you find in chapter 5, where the angel announced, don't weep anymore, John. Because someone has come, is worthy, is qualified to open that book. Who you see is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Can you describe him for me another way? He is the root of David. And he has prevailed to open the book. The root of David. And the Old Testament talks about Jesus Christ as the one, the branch of the root that will come out of Jesse. When it says out of Jesse, that's out of David. Because Jesse was the father of of David. In Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Reading from verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he shall make him of a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. Neither reprove after the hearing of his, of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor. He's talking about Jesus Christ there. You can see that the fullness of the Spirit of God is upon him. And he calls him the root, the stem out of the branch of Jesus. In verse 10, and in that day... There shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and its rest shall be glorious. Jeremiah chapter 23. Referring to Jesus Christ, looking at these titles that had been used for the Lord Jesus Christ, even from the Old Testament. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is this his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Is it only the Old Testament that refers to Jesus Christ with that title? Do we find anything in the New Testament in Romans chapter 15? Romans chapter 15, chapter 15, verse 12. Romans 15, verse 12, again, Isaiah said, There shall come, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the announcement was made in heaven that Jesus Christ has appeared and is able to open that book. As you come to uh, Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, it says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain. That's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. Behold, the Lamb of God that is slain for the sins of the whole world because he takes away the sin of the whole world. He was slain. That's his crucifixion and death. But then he says, it is standing that that a Lamb was standing when he saw him. And when that standing Lamb, that means that he's risen from the dead. Because of rising from the dead, that's why he stood. He saw that lamb stood. He said, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. But it had been slain, 
And then it says it has seven horns. Horns. That's the symbol of power. Seven horns. That's the symbol of perfect power. Complete power. And total power. The fullness of power. And seven eyes. Total insight. Total knowledge that he had. And these seven eyes are the seven spirits of God. Sent into all the earth. I've told you already in other passages we've read, we saw it in chapter 1, and we're now seeing it in chapter 5. We've seen it before in other places, the seven spirits. That's the fullness of the Spirit of God. As John saw, he saw the Messiah, this king, because the lion is the king of beasts in the forest, and the monarch of the forest. And so becomes the emblem of one of kingly authority and of power. Christ has the power to open the seals. And to rule over the universe, bringing all people, all things under his control. He's being called the root of David, connects him with the great and glorious king of Israel. He is worthy because his is a right to rule and to reign forever and ever. And John said, I looked and I saw that worthy one. I saw him as a lamb. I saw him showing his sacrifice for our sins. He was slain. But I saw him standing, risen from the dead. I saw him having all power, the fullness of power, seven horns. And I saw him with the perfect, complete knowledge. And I saw him having the fullness of the perfect operations of the Spirit of God. That is sent into all the earth. Christ, the Lamb of God, that was slain, is the lion, is the mighty conqueror, is the king of kings with perfect strength and wisdom to judge Satan and to judge sinners and to establish universal kingdom even upon this earth. Revelation chapter 5 verse 7 is the culminating, the great culminating act when Christ came and took that book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And as the lamb, the lion, the king, took that seven sealed scroll from the, from the hand of God, all of heaven breaks forth into singing the song of praise and of worship because the worthy one has appeared. Look at chapter 5 now and see the glory, the splendor, the majesty of the things that took place when Jesus, the Lamb of God, took that book. In verse 7 it says, and he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken that book, the four bees, that is the cherubims, that is the, 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 the living creatures, and then the 24 elders representing the redeemed of the Lord raptured already in heaven at that time. They fell down before the Lamb. And having every one of them halves and golden verse full of the odors, which are the prayers of the saints. What were they saying? They were singing unto the Lord. They sang a new song. Saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God. By thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and you, have and you have made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And then after that I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. That is after the book had been taken, because uh, there's no reason for sorrow anymore. There's no reason for tears anymore. The Lamb has prevailed. He has taken the book, and the earth is going to be redeemed, and it's going to reign forever and ever, and all heaven. All they could do now was to rejoice, and I had everybody, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And they were saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb. That was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, not only that, every creature which is on earth, not only that, even under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I had same blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that seated upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four bees said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down. They worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. When that time comes, are you a part of that redeemed church? You are part of that raptured church. You are part of that righteous saints of God in heaven. I believe you will be there. I said you'll be there when Christ comes because this is still future. This is still future. It's just showing us the glory of future things that, uh, that are to come. And when it's taking place, the church of God, righteous church of God, redeemed church of God, blood-washed church of God will be in heaven. I pray you'll be there. And when that thing happens and Jesus takes that book and he begins to open the seals 
and you are there and I'm there, by the grace of God, we will sing together. We will join the people of God and we will rejoice together with them in Jesus' name. Will you be there? I said, will you be there? Why don't you tell the Lord? Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord I want to be there? I don't want to be found missing. When Christ will come and take the book to redeem the earth, when he will conquer Satan, the usurper, when he will rule the earth, when he will redeem and save the whole of humanity, and when he will put all enemies under his feet, and when he will rejoice, when the people of God will rejoice because of what Christ is able to do. I want to be there. I want to be there. If you want to be there, it means that your sins will be forgiven. It means that you must be born again. It means you must be a child of God. A child of God even today. Living a victorious life over sin. Because it's only those who are living that victorious life that will be there on that final day. And then will you be with the people of God as you sing together with them. What is the Lamb? As the hosts of heaven will sing. As before the throne they make praises ring. Worthy is the Lamb to open the book. Worthy is the Lamb who once was crucified. This bleeding Lamb, oh, this bleeding Lamb, this dying Lamb, he was found worthy. The bleeding Lamb was found worthy. The triumphant church will sing. All of heaven will be ringing with the praises of the Lord. Thrones and powers before him bending. All the switch with voice ascending. Swell the chorus never ending. And all the chorus in heaven will be, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. They will come from every kindred and tongue and nation, shouting and singing, Worthy is the Lamb. You can join them. You'll be with them at that time to sing of the great salvation, saying, Worthy is the Lamb. Loud will be, mighty thunderings roaring, the floods of mighty waters pouring, prostrating before the feet of the Lord, adoring him, and saying, Worthy is the Lamb. You'll have a harp, I'll have a harp, and there'll be songs we'll be singing, sounding, Worthy is the Lamb. Mighty grace over sin abounding. Worthy is the Lamb. By his blood, he clearly bought us. Wandering from the fold, he sought us. And then glory safely at home, he'll bring us. And we'll be singing and shouting, Worthy is the Lamb. Sing with blessed anticipation. Worthy is the Lamb. Through the veil of tribulation, Worthy is the Lamb. Sweetest notes, all notes excelling. On a theme of forever dwelling, still untold, though ever telling, we'll be telling the story in heaven forever and ever. Worthy is the Lamb. We'll be singing, Worthy is the Lamb. We'll be shouting, Worthy is the Lamb. We'll be giving adoration, Worthy is the Lamb. Before the throne, Worthy is the Lamb. All over the courts of heaven, Worthy is the Lamb. When the saints go marching in, will you be there? Have your sins been forgiven? Are you living a victorious life? Are you living an overcoming life? Will you be there on that wonderful day, on that glorious day? Will you be among the people of God to sing with the people of God? Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. You must be saved. The blood of Jesus must cleanse you. All your sins must be taken away. You must be living a victorious life. Victorious life. By the power of the blood of the Lamb. You must be among the people of God who are saved. Among the people of God who are regenerated. Among the people of God who are living the overcoming life. Only then, only then, will you be among the people of God in heaven when that time comes. And then you'll shout and sing. Or oh, the people of God forever and ever worthy.